characters. Think of all this uh, directory information. Think of this as just a big text file. So that text file now is going to be displayed by more one page at a time. All right, that's what the pipe command does. So we'll hit enter here, and now you can see the various stuff. And we're just seeing one page of stuff in this directory. I hit spacebar, we're seeing one more page of stuff. And then I can even search in here if I hit that forward slash like we did in VI. I search and I look for a lib SSL or something. Maybe I'm looking for one particular library. And I do that, and then I find some lib SSL libraries down here. All right, so, so that's how you would look through the directory for uh, some, particular, uh, 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 some particular library. Another way that you could uh, narrow down what's uh, listed by ls is you can do an ls and say I'm looking for libc libraries. So I do an ls and I say libc star. All right? Now I hit enter there and only the files that start with libc are going to be displayed. The star says anything at all can come after libc, uh, even nothing, even if there was a file called libc it would be listed here, but the star, the star will match anything at all. Okay, so everything that starts with libc is displayed by this ls command. That's another nice way to narrow down what gets displayed by ls if you're looking for something in particular. All right, another place that uh, that libraries reside is in the slash user slash lib directory. So you could go over there if you're looking for some particular library. Now in a couple of videos down the road, we're going to talk about installing software and, uh, and, and software's dependencies on various libraries. And in that video, we'll talk about what to do if you go to install some software and you don't have the library for it. We'll talk about how you can resolve that dependency so that you do get that library so that you can install that software and it'll work correctly. But we'll save that for a couple of videos down the road when we talk about software installation. One of the last things I want to talk about in terms of planning our installation is planning out a disk partitioning scheme. Let me explain what a disk partition is first. So here's a representation of your disk, and, and you can partition the disk. Basically, all you're doing is slicing it up into pieces like this, something like that. Okay? And you might look at that and say, well, geez, that looks like the way my brother sliced pizza when I was a kid. That doesn't look very fair. Uh, but, but that's okay because uh, a different piece of the file system is going to reside in each of these partitions, and those different pieces of the file system are different sizes, so the partitions should look like this. They should look somewhat uneven. Okay, and the different pieces of the file system that you're going to put into the partitions, uh, remember the slash boot directory held all the stuff necessary to boot the system. So that goes into one partition typically. Uh, slash home holds all the user's home directories. So that could go in another partition. Another partition should be relegated to swap space. Uh, swap space is a space that's used by the operating system when main memory fills up. So say RAM fills up and there's a demand for more memory, programs need more memory to operate, then what the operating system does is take some of that stuff from RAM and temporarily writes it out to the swap partition, and that opens up some main memory uh, for that demand that, that, so it can meet that demand, and then later it'll pull the stuff back in from the swap partition into main memory. Okay, so this is just a temporary holding place. Only the operating system uses this. No regular users will ever write to the swap partition. And then everything else can just go here. Uh, typically, we represent that as just a slash. So if we specify some uh, piece of the file system or some directory explicitly to go in some partition, that will go there. And if we say slash goes here, everything that's not uh, specified explicitly to go somewhere else will go into this partition. Now, now, you have to guess the sizes of these partitions, and, and there's a little bit of care that should be taken there. Basically, if I guess a size, say, for the home directory, and, and people, you know, start filling up and start writing files and start downloading files and putting them in their home directories, and just say this whole thing filled up. But say there was still space in some of these other partitions. It doesn't matter. You're out of luck. You can't just, like, take this line and move it over a little bit and say, you know, make that partition a little bit bigger. You can't do that after the fact. You're going to have to back up all the data on the disk, save it off to tape, reformat and repartition this disk, and then copy all the data back onto the disk. So that's a really time-consuming and laborious process, so you don't want to underestimate the sizes of any of these partitions. So let me give you an idea on how big these partitions should be, and then you can work and, and, and determine for your particular installation how big uh, and, and what you want to put in each of the partitions, how big each should be and what you want to put in them. So for the slash boot partition, certainly 30 megabytes is enough for that. Uh, this isn't going to grow by leaps and bounds. Once you uh, put the stuff into the slash boot partition, you might, you might add something to one of the startup scripts or something like that, but certainly 30 megabytes is going to be plenty for anything that you do in the slash boot partition. 
Now, the slash home partition is going to be a lot harder to, to measure because that, that is going to grow from the time when you install the system. If it's just one user on the system, certainly a couple hundred megabytes or 500 megabytes is going to be fine for just a single user system. But if it's got multiple users on it, it could take up you know, 50 gigabytes or 100 gigabytes depending on what the use of the system is by those people. Now the swap space, that should be like 1.5 or 2 times the size of your main memory, of the RAM in your system. So if you've got 128 megabytes of RAM, 256 megabytes of swap space is going to be plenty. And then everything else can just go in here. So however big your disk is, if you've overestimated the size of this home partition already, just put the rest of the, mem put the, rest of the disk space for this extra partition here for everything else. All right, so there's a basic simplistic scheme here, but you don't want too many partitions because then you're going to be more likely to run into this problem of filling one of them up, and then you're going to have to go through that whole process of backing everything up and copying it back again. So just stick with you know four or five or three or four or five partitions on your disk. And, and in Red Hat, when you do a Red Hat installation, uh, there's there's two uh, standard installations in Red Hat. There's a, a server installation, and there's a workstation installation. And for those installations, you can, you can actually have the installation program guess the partition sizes for you, and that'll do a pretty good job. It'll look at your disk and determine how big various things should be, and it'll do a, a basic partition scheme for you that looks something like what I've just drawn. Okay? But if you do a custom installation in Red Hat, uh, and some other versions of Linux are going to have to do this uh, all the time. There is no, there is no like, standard installations that will guess the partition sizes for you in certain versions of Linux. Uh, if you do a custom installation or you have one of those versions of Linux, where you're, then you, you're going to have to guess and you're, you're going to have to make these choices about how big each partition should be. And like I said, just overestimate. And disks are so big nowadays, you're going to have plenty of room to overestimate all these partition sizes. Now maybe you're asking yourself and you're saying, well, can't I just get away with one partition, just like one giant partition, then I don't have to worry about any of these boundaries or anything like that? Well, I mean, you could, but there's certain circumstances where you're going to have to partition, like if you have multiple disks. Uh, if you have two disks in your computer, you, you can't have just one partition. You're going to at least have to have two. But there's other reasons, good reasons why you want to partition. Uh, one of them is overrun protection. So say you've got some partition here set up for your home directory, and somebody's written some program that's writing to a file, and they leave for the night, and they leave their program running, and say their program just goes out of control. It's not working at all the way they thought it was going to work. And basically, say the program just keeps writing to this file, writing to this file, and eventually it just fills up the entire home partition. Well, that's going to be a natural barrier to stop that program from working. It's going to try and write the file. It's going to start getting errors, and maybe the program's going to stop. At least it's going to stop eating up disk space because that partitioning barrier uh, is just going to stop it from writing to that file. So there's a natural barrier, and that way, that way it's not going to eat up and, and start taking space from you know critical system stuff like the swap space and other things that are on this disk. And if you start eating up space in those critical areas, maybe the computer's going to crash. At least this is going to keep the computer up, even if nobody can write to their home directory because it's filled, at least the computer's not going to crash and the various servers are going to be able to operate, that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's one reason. Another reason is just for easier administration. Uh, occasionally when disks, uh, after a while, you'll, you'll use a disk and you'll read and write files, and a disk will get fragmented. Basically what that means is that the open space on the disk is, is, is scattered around the disk, and that makes, you know, the, it just makes things less efficient. So then you go in as a system administrator and defragment the disk. Well, certain sections of the disk you could you could make read only, like the slash user directory, for instance. If you made that its own partition, uh, you you could make that basically a read only partition because it's just got a bunch of software and stuff like that. And so you know that part of the disk can't be fragmented because the only time things get fragmented is when you read and write and, and delete stuff. Um, and and then you know the open space starts starts getting scattered around. So there, th what that would cause you or what that would allow you to do is if you had one uh, section of the disk that was read only, you know when you go to do your defragment, you're only going to have to defragment some piece of the disk, and that's going to make the defragmentation process faster and just, you know, easier for the system administration. Okay? So, so there are some reasons why you want to partition. Of course, you could just have one giant partition on your disk, but if you had three or four partitions, you're going to get the benefits that I listed here, and it's really not going to be that much of a hassle or that hard to guess the sizes of those partitions. And the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up this video are the options that you have for a file system on your computer. The file system is like the underlying organizational structure that the computer uses to keep track of where all the data is on your disk. 
The most standard or most common file system that's out there today in Linux is the ext2fs file system, which just stands for the second extended file system. And this file system is completely robust, it's fully functional, it's, it's been well tested over the years, and this is, the, like I said, the most common file system that's out there. The only drawback to this file system is in the case of some kind of a, a